Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Bonjour, uh, and thank you for coming in so early uh, uh, to listen to this. Um, let's also restart the time. Okay, so uh, you've already listened to a great lecture by uh, Dr. Caravan about uh, the MR part of molecular imaging, and I'm gonna broaden this up to all different modalities. And uh, to do this, uh, oh, nothing to declare. Let's not forget, forget about this. And to do this, I'm just going to uh, talk about the sensitivities and um, spatial resolutions of all the different modalities available to us uh, for molecular imaging. So we have uh, magnetic resonance imaging and its uh, uh, sister uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And um, in terms of sensitivity, we're looking for MRI um, at nano to micro -mol uh, molar concentrations for T2. Um, such as an iron oxide, as we already heard about, and around um, 10 micromolar up for T1 contrast from uh, gadolinium linium chelates. Spatial resolution, we're looking at four microns, which is pretty good. Uh, spatial resolution uh, in experimental approaches, and then for clinical MRI, around 250 micrometers. Uh, MR spectroscopy for uh, protons is in the millimolar range, um, less sensitive than, than uh, with the contrast agents in MR, and our spatial resolution is uh, around five millimeter at, to seven millimeter at clinical field strength. So as we go up in field strength, we may increase our sensitivity and spatial resolution. So we also are using um, uh, X-ray based CT in molecular imaging. So for iodine based contrast agents that you can use with this modality, we're looking at the low millimolar range and 500 millimolar for gadolinium chelates, which can also be observed with CT actually. Spatial resolution is above 10 microns. Then for PET, positron emission tomography. We're looking at a very nice um, molecular sensitivity in the picomolar range, which makes this very attractive for molecular imaging. And spatial resolutions uh, above one millimolar for micropet and four to five milli, uh, sorry, millimeters, millimeters, and four to five millimeters in clinical pet applications. We have another nuclear um, modality, nuclear imaging modality, um, single photon emission computer tomography, short spec. And we are looking at a sensitivity in the picomolar range, also very um, good for molecular imaging for this reason. Spatial resolutions um, comparable to uh, a PET, actually. Um, we can use ultrasound for molecular imaging as well, and uh, the contrast agent of choice would be microbubbles, and um, we can detect around uh, uh, 10 to the power of six microbubbles per milliliter blood, and spatial resolution is pretty good, um, uh, around 40 um, uh, micrometers, uh, this should be, sorry, uh, and uh, yes, above that. So for optical imaging, we're looking at a sensitivity in the nanomolar range, um, or if you're, we're um, thinking about cell tracking applications, um, around 50 cells can be detected with fluorescence, and uh, around 1,000 cells with bioluminescence. Spatial resolution is uh, 25 microns for intravital, uh, for, for ex vivo, and for intravital microscopy, 1 to 15 um, micrometers, which is pretty good. So this is our armamentarium of uh, different molecular imaging modalities. And thinking about this um, then in terms of biomedical imaging, uh, traditionally we would be looking, using these modalities for anatomical imaging. Then um, 
We can also do functional imaging where we are looking at the dynamics of contrast agents, um, then also uh, imaging, you know, functional events where we've injected something and then perhaps we want to visualize the, the blood vessels. And then, of course, molecular imaging um, that I'll go into more detail. And there's also this... Um, Theranostic imaging that I'll explain in my talk. And so we're using these uh, different biomedical imaging uh, approaches in preclinical research, in um, cells and uh, rodents, and then also in clinical research. And the goal always, of course, is to get something that's uh, clinically translatable. So this is sort of the structure I'm going to be um, uh, adhering to. So, I, so these are the types of different molecular imaging approaches. If you think about it in terms of, I would say, the biology behind it, um, going to talk about receptor imaging, imaging of gene, gene expression, metabolic imaging, theranostic imaging, and along these uh, principles, I'll be giving you examples of. Uh, um, also, you know, multimodality imaging applications because we're not always, you know, restricted to one modality. I think the, the biological problem and the disease process are oftentimes driving then the um, uh, modality we are choosing. So in the end, I'll briefly uh, talk about instrumentation considerations for multimodality imaging. So receptor imaging. Pretty simple. For example, in cancer, we would have a cancer cell that it overexpresses some very um, unique receptors. And we would then use a um, ligand, for example, an antibody that carries an imaging reporter. And then this imaging reporter, depending on what modality we want to use, can be detected with this modality. And um, one important thing I really wanted to mention are size considerations when making your uh, imaging agent. So we can go from small molecules that have a size of uh, below one nanometer all the way up to relatively large nanoparticles where we're in the range of, of uh, 20 to uh, 90 nanometers. And um, basically, in general, we can say the larger the imaging agent, the longer it is, its blood circulation time is, the more difficult it is for this agent to extravasate into the target tissue, meaning, you know, get out of the bloodstream and get into the tissue of interest. And the larger the imaging agent, the more difficult it'll be to reach intracellular targets. And um, other key properties for imaging probes are that we have to think about our uh, biocompatibility. So is it secreted or degraded with our toxic effects? Then it's injectability. So if it has to be injected, it should optimally be water soluble, of course. Then uh, the delivery to the target organ at molecular target. So how well does it extravasate? And there, again, size considerations are important. How specific is it to get to the target organ and to the molecular target that we want to look at? And of course, always important, sensitivity. Do we have sufficient accumulation? Do we need an amplification strategy which would be determined by the molecular mechanism to be studied? And so Peter, in the previous talk, already really nicely um, gave some examples where, where we can amplify um, to then get to better sensitivity levels. So. As, as an example, I'm giving you a pet example because this is, I think, one of the success stories in, um, in molecular imaging is the uh, pet imaging of prostate-specific membrane antigen. And this was developed at Hopkins by my colleagues, Dr. Marty Pomper, and also Dr. Catherine Foss did a lot of work in this. So prostate-specific membrane antigen is a, a type 2 transmembrane protein. And it has actually N-acetyl-L-aminodipeptidase and folate hydrolase activity. So if you have your N-acetyl-aspartyl glutamate, um, then this is, uh, as shown here, 
NAAG is actually being hydrolyzed by PSMA into glutamate and NAA. And PSMA is a marker for prostate cancer, particularly in um, androgen independent disease, which is, um, uh, you know, a more, a more devastating uh, uh, part of the uh, type of the disease. And so um, what my Hopkins colleague, colleagues have developed are these um, F18 and also other nuclear imaging agents um, that are urea-based small molecule inhibitors of PSMA. And these molecules have a high affinity and uh, good in vivo selectivity for PSMA. And so um, this has gone from preclinical work started in the early 2000s all the way into the clinic. And I think this is why it's such a success story, because uh, it's already used in patients in Germany, for sure, and then also in more and more countries now. And um, so it's very good for uh, detecting uh, bone metastases. So shown here, there is a, um, a prostate cancer bone mat here shown with a um, PSMA PET contrast agent. And then it also shows up on a traditional bone scan, so that's good for validation. And then here as well in this cross section, you can actually see it very nicely um, then uh, overlaid with a CT. So um, PSMA, um, Imaging is also very good for detecting lymph node metastases from prostate cancer. As you can see here, this shows up actually very nicely and it's very helpful in the clinic if you have a prostate cancer patient and um, you want to make sure that, um, or you, you want to see if he has um, metastatic nodules somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to um, imaging gene expression promoter activity. So this is uh, a, uh, supposed to be a cell. And um, so to image a gene expression, we would either have a um, reporter gene that gets delivered, uh, or we already have a, um, a, a promoter that is already in the cell that we're interested in. And gene delivery typically happens by viruses, oftentimes, lentiviruses or adenoviruses. Then um, the DNA um, oftentimes integrates with uh, the cell's DNA. We get uh, transcription into mRNA, translation into the protein or um, imaging reporter that is then expressed. And we then image this by either optical MR, PET, or SPECT scanning. So one very famous example uh, by Dr. Roger Chen, the late uh, Dr. Roger Chen, I would uh, unfortunately have to say, is the development of the fluorescent proteins. And uh, green fluorescent protein was first developed by um, him in his lab from a chemiluminescent jellyfish, molecular weight about 27 kilodalton, this um, excitation and emission characteristic. And the good thing compared to bioluminescence is that you don't have to add any substrate to um, then detect it with uh, fluorescence microscopy. And so um, as this field moved on, uh, more and more fluorescent proteins have been developed. We have the whole spectral uh, range available in terms of excitation at emission. And so uh, I'm going to show you an example where we fused the TD tomato fluorescent protein to image hypoxia in breast tumors by a hypoxia-driven fluorescent switch. How this works is that we have used um, a lentiviral transduction of our breast cancer cells of interest, where we are um, uh, where we have cloned the uh, VEGF. Uh, uh, reporter that has a lot of hypoxia response elements uh, to, uh, to drive the expression of the TD tomato fluorescent protein. And so what then, so this is integrated in the cells. And um, what happens then is that we, um, um, uh, under uh, well oxygenated conditions of the cell, we uh, have uh, the hypoxia inducible factor one alpha um, being proteolized. And then under hypoxic conditions, it is actually stabilized, binds with HIF-1 beta, and then binds to these hypoxia response elements, which then drive the expression of the TD fluorescent tomato, uh, red fluorescent 
protein. And uh, this is shown here in breast cancer cells that um, are normoxic. You don't see the expression under uh, hypoxia. They nicely express this t 2 protein. And then as you grow them um, in the memory fat pad of uh, mice, you see here um, that very nicely only the hypoxic regions are outlined in um, this tumor model, so this is very helpful. So we also developed uh, the detection of this TD tomato fluorescent protein with um, a technique called MALDI mass spectrometry imaging, where you basically then uh, detect tri triptych peptides. And so here we've shown that the fluorescence actually nicely overlaps with uh, a triptych peptide uh, derived from the TD tomato. And so this is an example of ex vivo multimodality imaging of uh, optical fluorescence and MALDI mass spectrometry imaging. So now metabolic imaging, I realize Peter went into this already, so I'll be brief. So um, for metabolic imaging, we typically have a substrate which is then uh, modified or hydrolyzed by an enzyme to give a product that is detectable by our, um, uh, one of our modalities. And so a very classical example for this is the imaging of uh, glycolysis and the last step them then from pyruvate to lactate uh, by lactate dehydrogenase, which is overexpressed in cancer. And um, so traditionally, for a long time, ever since the almost the existence of MR spectroscopy in vivo, we've been doing this just with, um, with C13 labeled glucose and just um, you know um, approaches such as heteronuclear cross polarization following infusion with with glucose and you can see in this tumor model as you um, then take different time points the lactate peak is coming up which is C13 lactate peak is coming up. So then more recently this has been done by hyperpolarized um, uh, C13 spectroscopy, I'm not going to go into this too much since the similar example has already been explained. Just here briefly um, that this is a prostate tumor where we then see also the lactate signal coming up. So now um, I'm going to go into theranostic imaging. Theranostic imaging really is um, um, at the interdisciplinary interface of uh, imaging technologies, therapy, and nanotechnology. And um, so we are really combining um, a therapeutic agent, which could be a chemotherapeutic agent, or a bacterial toxin, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you name it. Could be anything, really, that is therapeutic. This is then typically um, attached to some sort of carrier system, such as liposomes, my, my cells, or like other um, carriers listed here. And then we have diagnostic agents, so basically imaging agents, either that are um, detecta detectable by PET or um, optically detected, um, and you name it, anything that works with the different imaging modalities. And so I'm going to show you an example uh, developed in the lab of my Hopkins colleague, Dr. Bujuwala, because it's also um, just good to exemplify uh, the multimodality imaging part and uh, really, um, yeah, it's just a good example, I thought. So um, they have developed this uh, PSMA-targeted nanoplex that carries um, uh, an siRNA against choline kinase. Choline kinase is an oncotarget in cancer, and it also has attached uh, cytosine deaminase, which converts um, uh, five uh, fluoro cytosine to five fluorouracil, and I'll explain in a little bit um, how that works. So the uh, imaging agent has all the all of the components I showed you in the previous slide. So it has a targeting moiety, which is uh, our urea-based uh, PSMA inhibitor. Then that is attached to um, this polyethylene uh, amine. And um, this is used to bind uh, the siRNA, uh, small interfering RNA, that then silences choline kinase. This has a linker attaching it then to 
PLL, poly L lysine, as the uh, carrier, which is attached to uh, cytosine deaminase. And so once we have then injected this and it uh, gets to uh, a prostate cancer cell that expresses PSMA, as shown here, it binds, so the, the PSMA inhibitor binds, and then uh, the uh, sRNA downregulates choline kinase, and the cytosine deaminase converts 5-fluorocytosine uh, fi uh, to 5-fluorouracil. And the reason we want to do this is because 5-fluorouracil is a very toxic uh, chemotherapeutic agent, has a lot of side effects, and so therefore we would like to um, uh, deliver, inject, fluorocytosine, which is non-toxic, and only have it converted in the tumor to the toxic agent 5-FU. So to show you that this actually works, and this was shown with the multimodality molecular imaging, so we have two prostate tumor models, the PC3 PIPs, which express PSMA, and PC3 flu, which don't express uh, PSMA. Here's uh, the non-expressing tumor that doesn't light up. The PSMA-expressing tumor does light up. And then this is also shown here ex vivo. We then showed that, indeed, post-treatment, we have an effective down-regulation of choline kinase, and that is uh, detected by the reduction in the total choline signal in a proton MR spectroscopy, shown here. Pre-treatment, high total choline peak. Post-treatment, it's pretty low. And the spectroscopic imaging is shown here. It's also significantly reduced. So then um, the functioning of uh, the uh, cytosine deaminase was also shown by in vivo uh, uh, fluorin MR spectroscopy. So this is 24 hours uh, post-treatment, you can see, and then, you know, post-treatment of the um, theranostic agent, and then we inject 5-FC, and you can see here two peaks, the 5-FC and 5-FU peaks, and then as it gets converted uh, with, over time, the 5-FU peak increases. And then you can go back and re-inject 5-FC because, as you've seen, it's a large imaging agent, theranostic imaging agent. It stays in the tumor for a long time, so you can actually re-inject. And you can see here very efficiently that, again, 5-FU increases. So this is an example of multimodality imaging of um, SPECT-CT, proton MRSI, and uh, fluorin MRS. So just briefly, towards the end, some instrumentation considerations. So um, how can we do multimodality imaging um, practically moving in between um, modalities? So what a lot of uh, people have done in the field is that we use imaging, animal imaging beds that can go into your optical scanner and then uh, the same animal bed can go into the CT scanner or into the MRI scanner. And then, you know, co-registration of the images is always uh, um, critical. And what we do for that is that we use fiducial markers next, placed next to, to the tumor in a certain orientation that'll help us with reconstruction and, you know, um, co-registration of the imaging. And then, of course, there are also more and more fused modalities coming out where your actual scanner already has both modalities integrated. And examples for that are PET-CT, PET-MRI, optical CT, and SPECT-CT. And so the strategy here is really that you have one molecular imaging um, modality that is good with sensitivity and another modality that is very good with um, anatomy so that you have that you're looking at the molecular process in its anatomic context so in conclusion i hope i've shown you that really the choice of imaging modality is driven by the disease processes that we would like to study which always then has considerations of mole the molecular biology of the disease, leading us to um, our molecular imaging uh, approach that we're developing. And so we have this um, huge list 
of uh, molecular imaging modalities now available. Some are better for um, the molecular part, some are good for the uh, co-registration to get the anatomy, anatomy in the context of the molecular process. And so with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues who have provided slides for this talk. would like to acknowledge uh, the NIH for funding, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.